They are also having a 150th celebration reception at the Helen Center, August 5th, 5 p.m., with uh, People Make It Happen, Art Opening by Donna Nicholson. <coughs> and, uh, architecture Seminar and Tour of Tyrande and the Reformed Dutch Church by the American Institute of Architects. That's August 6, 11 a.m. to 5 p.m. Register online. Uh, tonight's presentation is sponsored by the Beacon Historical Society in collaboration with the Howland Cultural Center and Howland Library. If you love Beacon history, become a member. We have brochures in the back or visit beaconhistorical.org or visit uh, the Beacon Museum uh, that's here in Beacon. Uh, thank you all for coming. Enjoy the presentation by Emily Murnay. Emily is a teacher a writer, a curator at the Man Red Homestead, and she is on the board of the Beacon Historical Society, and one of my very best friends, I know you're going to enjoy this presentation, uh, presenting my heart toward home, the life of Eliza Conklin. Tyaranda. To think I'll never again walk those halls. To think I'll never again walk the streets of Matawan. Have we done enough these last 30 years? At least they'll have the library. Thank goodness for that. It's strange. I never wanted a legacy. I was always so happy just to act, just to do what was right without any thought of how I'd be remembered. And yet here, in the library, surrounded by the great gift Joe and I gave our villages, I can't help but wonder, will they remember us? How will they remember us? Perhaps only by that name, Howland. That name wasn't always mine. I was born with three others, Eliza Newton Woolsey. 1835, the fifth child of eight, wealthy, worldly, wild woolies of old New York, whose father died in a ship explosion and whose mama cut ties with her slave-owning Virginia family in favor of raising a brood of outspoken abolitionists. We were a force of nature. There was a saying in our circle then, when the Woolsey children give up toys, they take up politics. <laughs> It was the weight of that privileged name, Woolsey, that made Mama so anxious to raise us as humble and charitable. It was our duty to be involved in the betterment of our nation and ourselves, or else that good fortune would go to waste on us. For Mama, that meant education, learning languages, teaching Sunday school, degrees from Rutgers Female College, and tours of old Europe when we reached marrying age. My tour came late, or else love came early. His name was Joseph Howland, and his childhood was strange, too. He spent his early years unable to attend school with his siblings, plagued by the ill health that would haunt his entire life. We shared an ancestor who came over on the Mayflower. We were childhood playmates, close in age, fond of reading. We both adored Coleridge. Joe yearned to join the ministry, a dream crushed by 
his delicate constitution. But that did nothing to quell his insatiable curiosity, something we shared. When we married in 1855, we took that grand tour, a four-year honeymoon that carried us across Europe, the Holy Land, and Egypt. A tour that lasted so long, my favorite sister Georgiana joined us partway through. The three of us had always been a trio. The other two were sure to follow, but in Italy it was only Joe and I that sat to have our bus carved by Giovanni Maria Benzoni, a reminder of how we looked then, young and in awe of the wondrous world. The year we returned to America, however, we discovered a place more dear than even the most exquisite sites of Paris or Jerusalem, the twin villages of Matawan and Fishkill Landing, nestled between a mountain and a river. We fell in love with them from first sight. We purchased a farm on the edge of Matawan, a sweeping wooded glen that stretched from the mountain to the banks of the Fishkill Creek. And with visionary architect Frederick Clark Withers at the helm, we began construction on what would become not only our estate and our livelihood, but our home. We couldn't settle on a name at first. We considered Glenhurst, but an English name felt wrong. We wanted a name that belonged to the land, so we chose Tyronda an Iroquois name for the creek that meant the meeting place of the waters. Withers built us a masterpiece, a castle grander than anything the villages had ever seen. The moment Joe and I laid eyes on that gabled facade, we knew we'd never want to leave Tyronda, that we would pass the rest of our lives happily beside the creek. But Joe and I weren't meant for a quiet life. Just as we began moving into Tyronda, tragedy befell our great nation. Civil War. From the first moment of the firing on Fort Sumter, Joe felt a solemn and compelling impulse, almost in spite of himself, to enlist. Making his decision quietly, seriously, he gave up our new home and all that it meant. In May of 1861, Joe enlisted as an officer in the New York 16th Volunteers. The reaction of our family was tentatively supportive. The prevailing sentiment was that Joe wasn't fit for military service. My uncle Edward, the man who became like a father to us after the ship explosion, even wrote to Joe to tell him as much. My family rallied around me, more or less convinced that Joe was doomed. Everyone, that was, except for Georgie. Bold, incorrigible Georgie, who always had a plan. The U.S. Sanitary Commission, led by the brilliant Frederick Law Olmsted, began securing recognition for women nurses from the War Department. They'd be given the pay of privates and sent to field hospitals on requisition. Georgie wasted no time in securing training as a nurse, despite the judgment of the all-male approval board that she was too young and too pretty to do so. That was only the first stage of Georgie's plan. Her second was to persuade me to do the same. A nurse's training would allow me to follow Joe to war, and the three of us could be together. But Joe and I had only just moved into Tyrondo when the war began. Someone had to stay home, if only to ensure home would be complete when Joe returned. I could stand by my home as honorably as any soldier at his post, but those first few months were more lonesome than all the winter. And at last, my persuasion came not from Georgie, but from the people of the Twin Villages. A friend visiting a tavern one night heard a fellow shout, any man who refuses to go now that Mr. Howland has gone ought to be drummed out of town. <laughs> that sentiment pushed many local men to enlist, and at last I came to agree. I couldn't spend the war at Tyronda. I would follow Joe and Georgie. You might consider that an act of bravery, but I didn't consider going to war very brave at all. It was a simple matter of doing what had to be done. The Union government was ill-equipped to fight this war, and... <laughs> But only the intervention of a benevolent public could make the difference. Georgie and I immediately attached ourselves to the New York 16th, and soon the Woolsey family fortune bankrolled the regiment's clothing, linens, medicine, and food. Still, I never wished to be recognized or celebrated for those humble contributions. When I donated the regimental colors, the flags used to communicate on the battlefield, I begged Joe to withhold any fuss or parades. A family friend presented them to the regiment on my behalf, and the men of the 16th swore an oath to protect those two silk banners with their lives. Now, money helped, but if Georgie and I had been content to simply donate supplies, we would have stayed home. 
We came to war to donate our time, our effort, and our hands to the task of caring for the sick and wounded. And while soldiers swore to lay down their lives for the honor of my flags, military doctors were waging their own war against the women nurses. From the beginning, we endured opposition, ill will, and unfeeling want of thought. Women who'd been delicately cared for at home were hard-worked, half-fed, and slept in closets. These inconveniences ingeniously arranged with the sole intention of driving all women from the hospitals. <clears throat> get a little worked up remembering that. <sighs> Even Dorothea Dix, the superintendent of army nurses, wasn't on our side at first. The sanitary commission was her personal nemesis, and any nurse under their orders was sure to earn her ire. But we were here to endure. We were here as pioneers. And as our sister Jane reminded us, obstacles exist only to be overcome. In time, by dint of unflinching persistence and hard work, we came to be accepted. We'd enlisted for the war, which we did not misunderstand to mean staying safely housed while Joe in the 16th march to danger and death. The hospital ships were dark and foul places where the wounded were sent, more often than not, to die slowly. We treated both Union and rebel soldiers then. Their wounds needed constant redressing to resist infection an amputation was frequently more efficient than treatment. Men who'd fought valiantly on the field were laying wasted by disease and cried like children for their families at home. There's no language to describe the suffering we saw. Thousands of men consumed and discarded by the shadow of war. My family kept that shadow at bay with their constant letters. And the 16th became like a second family to us. Whenever one of Joe's men found his way into our care, he became my particular concern and responsibility. And the 16th responded with unswerving devotion. Our photos were sent home to families as souvenirs. And one lieutenant composed a poem in my honor. There were times that everyone feared for our safety. My sisters, my mother, even Joe on occasion worried the hospital ships were too dangerous. I'd be better off at home. I never listened to their fears. It was my right and my privilege to go to war, to be of some useful purpose. All the while, our lovely home, Tyronda, was shut up and desolate, but we'd placed it in good hands. Our neighbor, the kind Henry Winthrop Sargent, became our superintendent and continued the work we'd left for the war. Day after day, he and Mr. Thompson, our head farmer, tended the grounds and the young trees we planted and raised a flag from the flagpole every morning. I peer into the darkness and the crowding fancies come. The night wind blowing northward carries all my heart toward home. I enlisted in this army, not exactly to my mind, but my country called for helpers, and I couldn't stay behind. My sister Mary wrote that. I used to remember it to myself late at night, picturing the banner at Tyronda, homesick and lonesome. The truth is, I did want to go home, and it was duty that kept me from it. But I wouldn't be kept from it long. Years later, somehow, the blame fell to the hats. Anticipating the blistering southern summer ahead, Joe presented the regiment with wide-brimmed straw hats, the very ones Matawan was famous for. They cut such a dashing image, they were named the Straw Hat Regiment. And soon the rebels associated the sight of these hats with bravery and stubbornness. Joe loathed recognition for his charity as much as I did, so the two of us developed a teasing sort of game where we made donations in each other's names. And that's how I got credit for these hats. I had nothing to do with them. And years later, after the war was over, someone would claim these hats made the men more visible on the battlefield, that the carnage of Gaines's mill could be traced to the foolish intervention of a clueless colonel's wife. 
I never attempted to set the record straight, lest the accusations fall on Joe. Joe, who'd already suffered so much. Gaines's Mill was the only rebel victory of the Seven Days Battles. New York's 16th casualties numbered in the hundreds. Joe was shot in the thigh while directing his men to position, but he never faltered once. He stayed on his horse, old Scott, until at last the regiment was maneuvered to safety and only then fell from his seat in fatigue. When he came to beneath a tree, the battlefield was cloaked in darkness and old Scott was licking his face. Joe, who had once been deemed unfit for war, was now hailed as the hero of his regiment. But that was the end of the war for Joe and I. Joe's injury refused to heal. He tried at first to return to his command, but after a bout of typhoid malaria, his suffering could no longer be ignored. The doctors warned that a relapse of the fever would prove immediately fatal. So Georgie would stay at the war until the bitter end, but Joe and I returned home. A friend warned us that the villages, enthusiastic for our return, were bent on throwing us a hero's welcome. So we arrived quietly in the dead of night to avoid the commotion and settled for a simpler address from our front door the next day. Mr. Thompson told us of the rumors that had flown that Joe had been shot in the face and was hiding the wound with his mustache, or that I had been rescued from a rebel prison camp. Apparently the arguments over these rumors had begun to interrupt church on Sunday. <laughs> and then there were reports of an apparition in the woods near Tyronda, a pillar of white mist that wept and screamed like the Irish banshee that comes to lament at the doorstep of a household touched by death. But we were home at last, so at last the rumors could be put to rest. The ones who didn't rest were Joe and I. In one year of war, we witnessed more horrors than we had wonders in four years of travel. We were no more capable of sitting idle than we were of leaving Tyronda again. We recalled our own lives, ones enriched by education and faith and came to the conclusion that only knowledge and compassion could save this world from the evil of war. So while Joe recovered, we planned and we waited. In 1865, Lee surrendered. We went to New York City to see the troops return home. A splendid sweep of the army passing away forever seemed to carry with it out of sight all the stormy four years of our lives. The mad, sad, noble war was over. The 16th presented us with parting gifts, a sword for Joe to represent his gallantry, and a Bible for me, signed by every man of the regiment in thanks for my devotion to their wounded. And Joe and I celebrated the end of the war with our own triumphant gift to the children of the Twin Villages, the Tyronda Free School, a schoolhouse and chapel downhill from our home. The children of Matawan and Fishkill Landing could now attend school whether their families could afford it or not. It was a promise of peace. But even as our friend Withers placed the finishing touches on the building, Joe and I knew it wasn't enough. We had to build more. Withers was by our side again in 1866 when Joe joined the commission responsible for building the Hudson River State Hospital where we advocated for the humane treatment of the mentally ill. Matawan lacked a hospital of its own, so in 1871 we established the Highland Hospital, complete with a children's ward furnished with donations from our school. The, when the Presbyterian Church needed a new building in 1872, Joe and I were among the first to step forward. But our finest contribution that same year would outshine all the rest. Our brother-in-law, Richard Morris Hunt, was rising in fame as America's finest architect. He built us a jewel of a building, almost a church. The first visitors were awed by the slate roof, the gables, the bold colors, but I love the windows best because 
Wichard's masterpiece was meant to be illuminated by natural sunlight. It was a library, our final gift to the Twin Villages, the only one of our projects to ever share our name. We both tried to find careers after the war, politics, banking, trade, nothing seemed to fit. With no children of our own, we devoted ourselves to our villages. From Tyronda, we reigned almost as lords of a kingdom, and our kingdom wanted not for charity, so long as Joe and I could serve. We taught Sunday school and funded education. We advocated for those who couldn't advocate for themselves, and we built. We built churches and hospitals, places where people could learn and understand and be kind to each other. Because that was the world Joe and I wanted to see. That was the world that Joe and I believed in. We wouldn't get to share it very long. Joe's poor health was the shadow over our happiness. In 1886, we embarked on another grand tour. We returned to Italy, where we had our bus carved 30 years ago, the same bus that now flanked the entrance of our library. When we reached Joe's illness returned, and as the doctors predicted, he never recovered. I buried him an ocean away. On his bedside were the two photos he always carried, one of the colors of the New York 16th, and the other of the Tyronda Free School. I can never return to Tyaranda. How could I go home without him? We were happy people, and now our happiness would haunt me if I returned to that empty house. Joe believed that we should never nourish sorrow, so I won't allow our memories to turn sour with loneliness. I'll go away to Rhode Island, where my cousins are, and I'll find myself some hard work to do. But first I had to come here. I came to our library one last time. Soon, this will be the only Howland left in the Twin Villages. I hope it serves them well. Whether they remember us or not, I'll never forget. I can never forget what Joe and I tried to build.
Well, I didn't die. <laughs> I spoke to a few of you before we did that, and I said I was afraid I was going to die in the middle of that. So we made it through. So thank you all so very much for being here to hear Eliza's story. Before we launch into the Q&A, I want to have an extra round of applause for my sibling, Mars, without whom this would be absolutely impossible. I would not have the hair, the makeup, the tech, the music, nothing if it wasn't for my partner in crime. This is my Georgie Woolsey. So thank you guys very much. <laughs> and uh, one more round of applause for the Howland Center, the Howland Library for the 150th anniversary of their foundation. So. If you have any questions, uh, this will begin the Q&A portion of our uh, presentation. And I'm a little dizzy, so I'm going to sit down. <laughs> yes? I'll kick it off the first question. OK. What does the spell mean behind the black and white behind you? Excellent question. <laughs> so the question is, what is the symbolic meaning of this black and white shirt hanging behind me? So this was one of the, uh, the, whole, the whole thing's full of Easter eggs, by the way. This was one of my favorite Eliza stories that didn't make it into the final version of the script. And that was when she and Georgie were working as nurses for the US Sanitary Commission on the hospital ships. As you can imagine, those situations were uh, not the cleanest. So uh, they had a very severe shortage of clean laundry on these hospital ships. And uh, in their letters back and forth, um, oh, I should have prefaced with that, the whole place that I got all of my information from is from the memoirs of Eliza and her sister Georgie. Uh, so as I was reading their memoirs, one of the stories that was in there was of uh, this one particular young doctor who was on the hospital ships and his name was Dr. Agnew. Dr. Agnew wore these very distinctive black and white flannel shirts. And one day he was about to go off rotation from that ship and he was leaving. And Georgie, uh, Eliza's sister, was so desperate for clean laundry that she grabbed him before he left the ship and said, Dr. Agnew, give me your shirt. <laughs> uh, so he took it right off and gave it to her. And uh, Georgie and Eliza kind of traded back and forth with this flannel shirt. And they came to find out that men's flannel shirts were the perfect garment for working on these hospital ships. So they set about ordering um, dozens of Agnews for the nurses to wear on the ships. And they refer to these style shirts in their letters as Agnews after Dr. Agnew, who so selflessly gave his shirt off his back for these suffering women nurses. So uh, if you are ever reading the memoirs of a Civil War nurse and you hear her refer to an Agnew, that's referring to the flannel shirt trend started by Georgie and Eliza. So, and the cockade on there is a Union cockade, of course, for the, for the uh, Union half of the Civil War. So, yeah. Uh, there are, <laughs> oh, for, for these particular hats? So um, that's a little difficult to answer because there were uh, several hat factories in Beacon, a few hundred hat factories in Beacon over the course of their, uh, their existence. Um, somewhere along the creek would be, would be the honest answer. Which factory in particular Joe ordered the hats from, I don't know. We don't even know for sure if he ordered them from Matawan. But Matawan was well known for straw hats. Joe buys straw hats. It would make sense that he would buy them from the place that he had his estate at, at the time. Um, but which factory it might have been, that I'm afraid I don't know the answer to. But I did want to set the record straight with the hat thing. If you read historical um, resources on Eliza, you'll see a lot of references to her purchase of these straw hats. And it's always slanted in this way that's very much like, Silly woman, war is for men. And that's not true. Um, Joe was the one who purchased the hats. It wasn't Eliza. It's just the two of them had this bit where they used to make donations in each other's names, which is well documented in Eliza's memoirs. And she writes a letter to Joe that's included in the memoirs that says, Joe, that was very sweet of you to put my name on the hats, even though I had nothing to do with them. So these hats that later got this severe reputation as being these big white target signs on the battlefield, that's not entirely uh, accurate. It was, it was well, number one, a theory that cropped up in the 1890s, long after the war was over. And second, um, Eliza had nothing to do with them. So if there's one thing you take away from the presentation tonight, that's all I want you to do is to clear Eliza's <laughs> reputation that she had nothing to do with the hats. <laughs> yes? The two flags um, that were in that unit, mm -hmm. do you know what happened to them? They went to war. <laughs> 
So, so the regimental colors, Mars, do you want to move back to the picture just for the hell of it? Um, so so uh, back in the day when you, <laughs> when you went to war, um, you know, there were ways of communicating on the battlefield uh, without radios or cell phones or anything that we would use today. And one of those ways was with colors. So you would have the banner of your regiment uh, and usually an accompanying banner. It could be the banner of your state, it could be the banner of your military, it could be the banner of your country if you were going against another country. But you would carry these flags and that helped people figure out where the regiments were positioned on the battlefield. Because if we're all in different regiments and we're supposed to be doing different maneuvers, but we're all wearing the same uniform, that can get very confusing very fast. So the flags were brightly colored banners used to communicate, and you would see them waving and you would hear the bugler bugling, and that way you would know what you were supposed to be doing at any given moment. Especially if there was a retreat and you had to get the heck out of there, you'd see that banner go running past. Um, they were a popular target for enemy soldiers because obviously you don't want your enemy to be able to communicate. So uh, we're all familiar with the game of capture the flag kind of gets its uh, inspiration from the treatment of regimental colors on the battlefield. You would actively try to destroy your enemy's colors because that meant that they would have one less communication tool. Um, the 16th was particularly proud of their colors for two reasons. One, because Eliza commissioned them from Tiffany's in New York City and donated them to the regiment, um, which she was very shy about. Um, and two, the colors were never touched by a Confederate hand. Never once during the entire battle were those flags ever touched by a Confederate soldier. They were never lost in a battle. They were never released in a battle. Something like 18 men were shot down holding these flags, and the next guy would just pick them up and continue carrying them, and they were never captured by, um, by the Confederates. So the 16th was very proud of that. Yes, they are in the uh, New York State Archives. Yep, so uh, there's a wonderful color photo that I didn't include because I was going with a whole black and white thing for the slideshow, but there is a lovely color photo of the flag that is on the right in that picture. And if you look up colors of the New York 16th Volunteer Regiment, then you can see uh, it doesn't look like much. It was dark blue, uh, as most uh, New York-related things are, and it had some gold and red on it as well. <laughs> um, can I show you? <laughs> uh, so, so this presentation was originally supposed to be presented in March of 2020. <laughs> and something happened um, that stopped us from having this presentation. So we were originally going to be doing this. It was probably going to be in St. Andrew's Church down on the west end of town. Um, it was going to be for the, like, a, a very late year of the woman kind of celebration. It was going to be for Women's History Month. Um, it was not going to be for the Howland 150. And then something happened, and uh, we had to cancel the show. I believe the original air date was going to be March 23rd of 2020. Um, and I still, in fact, I remember being at Tyaranda, you know, um, out, on, out underneath a tree, outside of view of any of the windows, um, practicing my lines, and uh, it was like March 11th, and saying to myself, like, man, the news is starting to get really serious about this COVID thing. I wonder if we're going to have to postpone the show. <laughs> uh, so we did for uh, two years, and um, in the meantime, uh, in January of this year, we were looking for a program for July. And Diane Lapis, who's the current president of the Historical Society, she said, Emily, do you think you'd be able to do that program um, we canceled because of the pandemic? And I was unemployed at the time. And I said, yes, totally, absolutely. I have all the time in the world to do that. And then I got a job. So, um, so I've got my books that I used for research here. I hid them because they're not historical. but." Um, my tabs, <laughs> color-coded. We've got um, Eliza's memoir that she and Georgie wrote, and it's the compiled letters of all of their family during the war. So all those eight siblings, their mother, cousins, extended family, spouses, future spouses, uh, all the letters that they exchanged during the war compiled in chronological order so that way you can know the family's entire experience from uh, before the war started till just after the war ended. Uh, and I read that one. It took me from uh, April 21st to June 15th to read that one. Uh, quickly followed up with um, 
I write the numbers on the books because that's what my grandfather does, by the way, in case anyone's wondering where I got that from. Um, and then the second one was uh, Bull Run to Chancellorsville. This is uh, an account of the New York 16th, so all the activities of Joe's regiment during the war. And uh, that one was a little quicker. That was uh, June 16th to June 26th. Um, and technically, I'm still reading uh, the poems of Walt Whitman because they didn't have necessarily something to do with the Howlands. But uh, Memorial Day, there was a fantastic keynote speaker at the Memorial Building on Main Street. Her name was Edie Meeks. She was a combat nurse in Vietnam, and she gave the most fantastic address. And uh, as soon as I could get up to her after the Memorial Day proceedings were done, I said, Miss Meeks, I need to steal pieces of your speech for my presentation on Eliza Howland, who was also a nurse. And she said, sweetheart, don't plagiarize from me here, and she pulls Walt Whitman out of her purse <laughs> and hands me that, because Walt Whitman apparently was also a medic during the uh, Civil War. So, so I did draw some inspiration from, uh, from Walt. Uh, so to answer your question in a way that wasn't just show and tell for my books, uh, it, some aspects of the show were planned already two years ago, and um, a lot of the re-research that I did was all this spring, refreshing all of this information. Um, the slideshow, parts of it are recycled from the original. The script, parts are recycled from the original. Uh, in general, I went back and I added a lot more information and uh, made it hopefully a lot better than it would have been the first time around. <laughs> so. <laughs> oh, here. Yeah. Well, the, uh, the Howlands and the Woolseys both were very, very old money families in New York. Um, uh, I mentioned it briefly in the script. Joe and Eliza shared an ancestor who came over on the Mayflower. Uh, if you're into genealogical societies, then you know the Mayflower people are... Um, they go way, way back, and uh, a lot of those families uh, were very well off at the beginning and probably are, to a degree, very well off today. Uh, so Howland was, John Howland was one of the original Mayflower uh, passengers. He was also uh, one of the Mayflower patentees. Um, so he was kind of a big deal at the time, and the Howland family continued to be prominent through uh, all the years of American history. The Woolseys were actually from down south. Uh, Eliza's mother, Jane, was actually raised in Virginia. She was raised on a plantation. Her family did own slaves, and that was a major point of contention in the Woolsey family during the war because Jane left the south and came up to New York. And oh, No, her family was the Newtons. She married a Woolsey. Um, so it was the Newtons of Virginia. She comes up to New York. She marries a Woolsey. This doesn't necessarily sit well with the family during the war because she became very outspoken abolitionist, raised all of her kids to be very outspoken abolitionists. And there's some letters between cousins that uh, had some not very nice words in them. Um, so the money goes all the way back. They just kind of had it from the beginning. They were also very involved in uh, the... Uh, um, Donna, what's the word for it? Where is she? She left. <laughs> Donna knows the name, of, name for it. There, the, the trade going on in like the East Indian Ocean, um, the Howlands were involved in that. So that's where Joe got some of his money. And I found a weird anecdote while I was studying that Joe Howland's mother, Joanna Esther Hone, her family were business partners with the skanks who started Matawan Manufacturing here in Beacon, which means very much to some of us and very little to others. Matawan Manufacturing was one of the first hat factories here, kind of established the industry. The Skanks were related to uh, the Bretts, who were the founding family of this area, and uh, so they all kind of tie in together. Old money. Yes? Georgie lived uh, to a ripe old age herself, uh, not as long as Eliza. I think Georgie was the second to last to go. So Georgie and Eliza survived the longest, uh, but it was just Eliza left at the end. They, they didn't live together. Um, Eliza moved to Rhode Island after Joe died. Um, and that whole dramatic thing about I can't return to Tyronda, that is historical fact. I wasn't putting that in there for dramatic effect. Um, she decided not to return to the Hudson Valley because she felt that she wouldn't be able to bear up under the memories of what she and Joe had done here. So she went to Rhode Island. She bought a house next door to her favorite cousin. And that's where she lived for the rest of her life. Um, and then Georgie was married to Dr. Francis Bacon. I know there's a lot of Dr. Bacons that are famous, but 
this was Georgie's Dr. Bacon. He was a surgeon during the war. Um, they uh, were not married during the war. They married after the war, and they lived in Connecticut. So uh, Georgie and Eliza never got the chance to live together again. I imagine there was probably lots of trips back and forth between Rhode Island and Connecticut, but that was the last time they shared a home was during the war. And uh, as far as what happened to Tyronda and Eliza's sisters, Eliza's two oldest sisters who never married and never had families, they actually ended up moving into Tyronda for a couple of years after Eliza left. I haven't been able to figure out exactly how long that was, though. Do you know how long Georgie stayed in the war after? Till the end. Till the end. Georgie, Georgie was... So I, I like to think of them as kind of like one's red, one's blue. Eliza was definitely the blue. Georgie was definitely the red. She was, uh, she was a spitfire. She um, didn't take no for an answer. Uh, I think the anecdote that best describes Georgie is that at the end of the war, she collected newspaper clippings of all of the carnage that the Confederates had wrought during the war, and then other newspaper clippings of how fantastic it was that the Union had won. And then she stood outside General Lee's house and paid people to go tape them to his front door. <laughs> so if you need to know anything about Georgie, that's the story, and you can get everything you need to know about her personality from there. But she was very gung-ho about being a nurse, and she stayed at the war until the very end. Yeah. So. Tell us about the ring. Oh, <laughs> so I'm, uh, I'm wearing a ring on this hand that's made of um, cow bone, and the reason I'm doing that is because in one of Eliza's letters, she mentions that um, a soldier who had been held prisoner in a Confederate camp was brought onto the ship, and um, there had been nothing to do. They were pretty much like stuck in a big room with like very little food, very little light, very little movement. And the poor fellow had gotten so bored that he had saved a beef bone from his previous meal like a week earlier and had whittled it down into a ring. And he gave it to Eliza while she was nursing him. So um, she mentions that in one of her letters. And I said, I think I need to have a bone <laughs> to, <laughs> to reference that. I thought that was such, a, such an unusual um, anecdote. Yes? Where did I get that? <laughs> Um, uh, Jeffrey Bezos. Um, oh, back, oh, oh, back then? Where did they get the dresses? Um, I mean, honestly, uh, she could have purchased it, uh, or it could have been made at home. All of the Woolsey siblings were uh, very good seamstresses, including little brother Charlie. Um, there is an anecdote about uh, the oldest sister, Abby, where she was taking notes on what she had sewn for the war, and she sewed like 600 shirts for the war. So it's very likely that they could have been making their own clothes at home. Yeah. Yes? I am not wearing a hoop skirt. That's very intentional. Uh, Georgie and Eliza write in their memoirs that uh, wearing a hoop in the very confined hospital ship spaces was dangerous because you would knock over medicine bottles and waste medicine, or you would knock over candles and set everything on fire, or you would just generally be in the way in an emergency. So a lot of the women nurses switched to wearing petticoats instead because they were softer and you could get through. How this was more practical than just putting on a pair of pants, I don't know. <laughs> because I'm having a very hard time moving in this. But uh, that's what they did was that they wore petticoats instead of a hoop. And they complained when the new nurses would come on for their first uh, you know, round of nursing, they would still have their hoops on. And they'd have to be told, you need to go take that off because you're about to make yourself a huge nuisance. Um, so yeah, petticoats, no hoop. Um, We do. Um, I don't know terribly too much about it. Um, and if the owners of the building currently are in the room right now, I would love to meet you. And I'm also sorry for admitting to trespassing on your property two years ago. <laughs> I promise I totally haven't done it at all since. Um, so the property is currently owned by um, Mirbo Spas uh, that are based out of Rhinebeck, I believe. At least they already have a facility in Rhinebeck. Um, they purchased the property and they are going to turn it into a hotel and spa. Very, very high end. I definitely recommend looking up some of their um, architectural plans online. If you Google Tyronda and do a little poking around, you will find it. Um, they haven't done any social media that I've seen yet for the Tyronda location. Uh, so really all we have to go off of is the understanding that Mirbo has it and um, that you know, there's some mock-ups of some architectural plans that they plan on doing. If you attend the tour that the uh, architects are doing on August 6th, then perhaps you will learn more information. Um, I saw something yeah. today, and uh, I, was, I was, I'm very curious, because it said that the Tyrone School is 
said was a change to our own development. But it, the, the way they worded it, it had me wondering, hoping that they're not going to tear it down, that that, that they did repurpose it. So I put that out on our Facebook page if anybody answered it, because I read it this morning. Yeah, my understanding is that they are not making significant changes to the exterior of the buildings. And again, I'm not... I, I think they. I think they are taking the the modern the modern um, edition off. But as far as this, I think this is supposed to remain the same. And uh, I'm not sure about the tire onto school. I'm unfortunately not cool enough to be an architect, Steve. Um, but uh, so you will have to go and speak to the architects about that uh, to know more about what their plan is going to be. I imagine they know much more than we do at this point. Actually, the, uh, the link is on the Instagram for the Howland. Um, I was trying to look at it since we're starting. Yeah. Yeah, I think the, uh, I think the uh, URL is um, AIAWHV.org. Okay. Yeah. If you go on the Howland Cultural Center's social media, they have shared a link to it. Um, so you do have to register online ahead of time. It is not a free event like this one was. You will have to pay um, a ticket price for that. But if you are really, really hooked on this building, as I think every single person who's ever seen it is, um, if you have the opportunity to get in there, I can't recommend it enough because it's gorgeous. This is, if you take 9D out toward Cold Spring, um, you'll see this on your right just after you pass Mount Beacon Park. It's like maybe two blocks past the mountain. On the right. <clears throat> yeah, it's across from the University Settlement Camp. Uh, so if you know the University Settlement Camp or the uh, City of Beacon Public Pool, then um, you will see Craig House across from there. And I keep referring to it interchangeably as Tyronda or Craig House because, of course, it was Craig House Hospital for many, many, many years. And in the original iteration of this presentation, I had lots to say about Craig House because I'm fascinated by that as well. But unfortunately, tonight's all about the Howlands. So if you want to know more about Tyronda as Craig House, you might need to join the Beacon Historical Society. <laughs> Do we have anything else? Yeah? Emily, did you say there were people in the room who are associated with Mirabel? Uh, no, I said I sure wish there were. Oh, and if they are here, I'd sure like to okay. meet them. <laughs> Mm -hmm. And that is, your presentation was absolutely fabulous. Thank you. I've read about the Mirabeau plan, and I've had memory that it stayed at the facility upstate New York in Orlando. I would suggest somehow that you or the Allen Culture Center make a to the executive and that you bring them for a show. Because I think it's very important to them to recognize the history of the building and the importance of the building to the community. I agree. So I think your presentation will stir an interest in the developer. There, this is a world-class development. This is something that Deacon has done very well for itself in the past 20 years and before, but this is going to put Deacon on the ground. As an international travel person, I can tell you, people are already going to their facility of upstate New York. This will definitely help the city of Deacon. I agree. So I think it's important to them, but there's something else that I think that's important, and that is that they take a piece of their facility. Room, or it might be a room of size, but it's a half the size of it. And they should put the history of the Howard in that room so that the international visitors from all over the United States and the world that will be staying there will get a taste of Deacon and the history of Madeline and the history of the Howard. I agree. Can we give Pat some? <laughs> So um, I, just, I just want to repeat some of that because we do have the live stream going upstairs and I want to make sure the folks at home heard that, especially if any of them happen to be our friends from Mirabeau who are buying Tyronda. 
Um, what Pat was saying is uh, it's really, really important that everyone understand the importance of the Howlands and the importance of this estate to our local history. Um, and uh, I hope the rest of the board of the Historical Society doesn't mind me saying, um, I would really like to invite uh, those people who have purchased Tyronda to come and see this presentation or at least come to uh, Leonard Street to our headquarters and see the exhibit that we have on the Howlands. Uh, to come to Beacon and to hear the Howland stories to understand how dearly they're loved by everybody here. Uh, I don't think anyone has ever met them or heard of them who hasn't instantly fallen in love with them. And we treasure them so dearly and we treasure their homes so dearly. So, um, you know, if we could make that connection with those folks in some way and, and uh, persuade them to keep that historical legacy in mind as they proceed on their project, or if we could convince them to have some of the Howland presence in their facility when they uh, get to that point of building it, that would be wonderful. The folks at home can't see it, but we've got a room full of nodding heads and people saying, mm-hmm, because, <laughs> because Beacon still loves their Howlands. I mean, they really built us from the ground up. So um, yes, I agree with you, Pat, and thank you for saying all of that a lot more eloquently than I just recapped. <laughs> about the property itself and the gardens? I would. Uh, so I mentioned uh, Henry Winthrop Sargent, uh, and we've got some Sargent Elementary School alums here, so, um, you know, uh, myself included. Uh, so Sargent, uh, Henry Winthrop Sargent, he was a horticulturalist um, who wasn't originally from here. He was originally from Boston. At the ancient, ancient age of 30, he decided to retire from being a lawyer, and he wanted to study trees instead. So he came up to the Hudson Valley, and he and his family purchased a plot of land near what's now Sargent Elementary School, and they established their estate uh, called Wodeneath. And Wodeneath was uh, kind of like an arboretum. Uh, Sargent was a tree collector. He would travel the world and bring back trees, weird and unusual, interesting trees from all over his travels. And uh, he was also a landscape architect. So when the Howlands wanted to landscape their property, and if you've seen it in person, you know it's a lot of property now. It was even more property back then. Uh, Henry Sargent was their neighbor. They had him come in to do the landscaping, which wasn't completed by the time the war started, which is why Henry Sargent became their superintendent, so he could continue his work on the land while they were away. Um, if you are able to go to the property, with permission, um, then you will see some of the most gorgeous trees in the Hudson Valley. Probably the most famous one would be the weeping hemlock, which is not visible in this picture, but there is a weeping hemlock tree on the property that was planted there when the Howlands were still alive, and it is still alive today. It is uh, one of the most historic specimens of that species in America, probably in the world. Um, and it's really neat that it's right here in Beacon. So lots of other rare and interesting trees too, tulip trees, ginkgo trees. Yes, Eli Eliza did donate some of the property to the settlement camp. Um, in her old age, uh, she was looking to uh, no longer have possession of the property. That would have been after her older sisters moved out. And first, she actually tried to offer it to uh, the local government. She said, you know, you could establish a school, you could establish a park, you could have it for some public works. Um, they turned her down because it was a behemoth of a property and uh, they just didn't have the finances available at the time to maintain something like this. Uh, so then she turned to the university settlement um, and offered it to them and they, uh, they established themselves there. Uh, another name that would be fun for history buffs in the room to look up is Charles B. Stover, uh, the father of the American Playground. Uh, he was the head of the um, university settlement and uh, was pretty much the inventor of outdoor recreation as we know it. And he built the summer camp that is now still in operation on the university settlement camp property today. So camp at the camp comes from a very long line of very historic uh, summer camps um, that were built on the Howland property. And Charles Stover himself also died in the house that the Clearwater, Clearwater office is in. That was where he lived the rest of his life. Very interesting person. Um, a little tidbit I'll feed you just so that way you're more interested in looking up his Wikipedia page. He mysteriously disappeared for two months and then came back, quit his job, and told nobody where he went. Um, very, very cool, interesting person. And if you go walking around up at the summer camp, you will also see some little architectural oddities 
that he worked into the camp as he built it, a lot of mosaics that would seem to have been his art form. So, uh, so yeah, so Eliza donated it to University Settlement and uh, the, rest is, the rest is history. Else? Yes? They are at the Howland Library. So you can actually still go visit Joe and Eliza face to face, which is really cool because their marble busts are at the Howland Public Library. You can go in, you can ask um, someone at the front desk where they are, they're right there by the front, and you can stand face to face with these uh, life-size busts of Joe and Eliza at roughly the age of 19 and 20. So, I mean, they were kids when they had these busts carved, good looking. Um, and uh, what's really part of the tragedy of research is I hunted and hunted and hunted through our archives at the Beacon Historical Society, through archives at uh, other historical societies. I wrote to Newport Historical Society. I wrote to the Caroline Faraday House that has the Woolsey Family Archives. I wrote to Long Island Historical Society uh, where they're right up, right up the street from where the uh, Woolseys are all buried. I wrote to everybody. Nobody had a picture of Joe and Eliza together. So this is the best we've got, is their marble busts that are still side by side at the library um, to greet the patrons of the thing that I think the two of them were proudest of. So go visit them. Go say hi to them and say, hi, Joe and Eliza. Thanks for giving us this fantastic library. Yeah. Uh, I know you wrote this two years ago, but how many times have you and your sister practiced this? <laughs> Um, so what you've just watched was actually our first 100% full run through of the entire presentation. <laughs> so if you were quietly saying in the back of your head, oh my God, that sounded like she's never even done it before. You were right. No. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, so that script, uh, that script was probably about six pages of material. Mm -hmm. It's taken me a month to memorize it. I did mostly memorize it driving in my car to and from work, getting groceries, whatever. Uh, and speaking in tongues to yourself in a fast stage whisper is not the same as theater. So, um, you know, and then plus, I mean, we don't want to disturb the, the Howland Cultural Center has already been so accommodating to us these last couple of days coming in every morning to do rehearsals, but they're running lots of awesome programs in here all the time. They have art shows, they have concerts, they have plays, they have all these wonderful things. So um, we've just uh, rehearsed this in person the last couple of mornings, but with the music and the slideshow, and the hair and makeup done, and the whole kit and caboodle. That was the first time. <laughs> so. so thank you guys for being good sports. Donna, what is this? A gift. A gift? For you, for, for all the hard work you've done. Aww. I wasn't expecting story. this. I wasn't expecting this. Should I unroll it? Is this, is this yeah. a now gift? Yeah. Oh boy. Oh my gosh, okay, so before I unroll it all the way, I have to tell you, Donna back here is an artist, and she is the one who is doing the People Make It Happen art opening on uh, August 5th to celebrate the Howland 150. She's got these wonderful collages, these pictographs that tell the story of the entire history of Beacon. She's an amazing visual artist. If you're here August 5th, I'm, I'm gonna be out of town. I can't even begin to tell you how disappointed I am in myself. Like, I've studied the Howlands for so long, and I didn't make plans to stay in town for August 5th, you guys should all be here. You should be here. They're going to ring the church bells next door. All right? They're going to have a whole thing here. And Donna's art is going to be hanging on these walls. And it's amazing. And it's gorgeous. And it's celebrating the history of Beacon. And one of the stories that she asked me to tell for her was the story of Joe's two photographs that he carried for the rest of his life. And he called them War and Peace. All right? So there was a regiment flags for war, and there was the Tyronda School for Peace. Again, that's not making it up. That's real historical fact documented in the family records that Joe carried those two photos with him everywhere he traveled for the rest of his life and put them next to his bedside everywhere he slept. So when I told Donna that story, she created a pectograph of War and Peace. So there it is. <laughs> So this will be hanging here in the Howland with um, some notes next to it explaining all of the things that she's added to this picture because if you look closer, there are things to find here that are not quite the same as the pictures I had on screen. So uh, I really encourage you all, you have to come to 
Donna's art opening on uh, August 5th to celebrate the Howland 150 here in the building that it's all about. So thank you, Donna. This is really, really special. Now I'm gonna mangle it trying to roll it back up. Yeah, I'm gonna have to I'm gonna have to lay it flat. Oh thank you, Donna. Donna, you're incredible. You are incredible. You're amazing. You're amazing. So um, do we have any further questions? Anything else? Anything that's who am I going to study next? Oh my God, I've had Howland brain rot for so long, I don't know. Maybe I'll dive really in on the second stage of Tyronda and I'll, uh, I'll get Craig House brain rot next and I'll dive in on the Slocums. Who else are you? Who else am I? Um, uh, this is uh, not the only historical woman in Beacon that I've been known for playing. Um, I have uh, played Madame Brett, Madame Katharina Brett over at the Madame Brett Homestead for five years now. Um, <laughs> So um, that started back in 2017 with Robin Lucas, who introduced me at the beginning of the event. I had her host for a specific reason, because Robin is the brain uh, behind the um, uh, Ghost in the Mist ghost tours through the Beacon Historical Society. And uh, it's because of Robin's idea of having these historical tours where we have historical interpreters telling stories from their lives to an audience um, that I got the inspiration to do this presentation. And it's also thanks to uh, the ghost tours that I uh, bother putting on historical costume at all, because originally I was just a playwright, and then I got put uh, up in front of a crowd, and I had to do it, because otherwise we would have no actors. <laughs> so I learned quick, and I've done Madame Brett for a uh, Melzinga chapter of the Daughters of the American Revolution, who operates uh, the Madame Brett homestead. I've played Madame Brett for them for five years now. It'll be five years this fall, and that doesn't feel real. <laughs> Thank you, Joan. <laughs> So, yes? She settled in Newport, and actually, uh, for those of us who stayed, can I do one more little show and tell for you? The thing I'm proudest of? During the course, during the course of my research, um, no, this one here. Uh, during the course of my research, um, I learned that most of the Woolsey siblings became authors. And Eliza, as mentioned in the epilogue, she became her family's historian, and she published several genealogical texts, uh, one of them being the book of letters of her and Georgie, and the other being the uh, history of the Woolsey family. So the history of her father's side of the family going all the way back as far as she could go. And she published these books originally just meant to be kind of references for her nieces and nephews to use when they were learning about their family. And all these years later, um, when I was researching Eliza, I was away, I was out of state, I was on a little research vacation. Um, I had spent several days sitting in a local park just power reading through Eliza's letters. And for the hell of it, I plugged her name into eBay. And a um, copy of her family records came up and uh, it was listed. I'm not going to tell you for how much because you'll get jealous of me. Um, but it was listed for very cheap and uh, it has her signature oh. on the inside. And um, I, I mean, I was flabbergasted. Uh, I thought I was going to drop dead. And then it, uh, it came home and it wasn't damaged and it was perfect and everything was wonderful. And then we opened it up and my mother found Eliza's calling card. Oh with her address in Newport, Rhode Island. So her address is still the same today. It is 97 Rhode Island Avenue in Newport, Rhode Island. You can look that house up online. It is gorgeous. I would expect Eliza to live in nothing less than the most pretty house in the world. Um, and she lived right next door to her favorite cousin, Sarah Woolsey, um, for uh, the rest of her life. She lived in that house. So uh, it was very great that it was kind of accidental research. I had been looking forward to sitting with like Fulton newspapers and uh, making a bunch of phone calls and writing a lot of emails and trying to figure out where did Eliza go after she left the Hudson Valley. It was a little bit of a mystery. We knew that she went to Rhode Island, but we didn't know where. And then her calling card fell out of the book. <laughs> so now we know, 97 Rhode Island Avenue, Newport, Rhode Island. And, uh, and the house is still there and it looks probably pretty much the same that it did. Uh, when she lived there, updated interiors, but uh, we'll take what we can get. And um, so, yeah, so that's uh, that's probably one of my favorite things that's happened to me over the course of this research was finding her, finding her calling card in her book. <laughs> it felt like she, it, it did feel like she was speaking to me. So, 
So yeah, I guess that's, uh, unless we have more questions about, um, about ELIZA, about the research, about the Howland Center. We've got lots of people from the Howland Center who could answer questions. Yeah. What was your biggest source of information? The biggest source was definitely ELIZA's letters. Um, that was the, the concrete base of the information. That's where I got all the information about her whereabouts during the war, her activities, who she was talking to about what. But um, if I was going to pick for the tone of the whole thing, actually at the Beacon Historical Society, we have the memorial booklet um, with all of the eulogies given at Joseph Howland's memorial service. Um, he was buried in the south of France. Uh, his body was not brought home. But when um, Eliza did return home, she wasn't here for it, but the Tyronda school gave a memorial service for Joe. He was the principal of their school. Um, he was the founder of their school. He was very well beloved by the villages. Uh, so they held this huge memorial service with these eulogies by like all of the Howland's very influential preacher friends. They were very devout. And, uh, and it's really through those eulogies that I got the greatest sense of who Joe and Eliza were. Um, so uh, that unfortunately hasn't been digitized yet. That'll probably be one of my next projects at the Historical Society is to get that digitized so other people can read it. But I did have the honor of reading that and that did have a lot of information that helped me understand who Joe and Eliza really were. Richard Morris Hunt was married to Joseph Howland's youngest sister. Yep, yep, he was uh, Joseph Howland's brother-in-law. And this is not the only thing that Richard built for the Howlands. He built the library, of course, but he also built the music room edition on the side of Tyaronda. So if you look at Tyaronda, you look at that octagonal kind of section all the way to the left, that was Richard Morris Hunt's addition onto Frederick Clark Withers' main building. And that houses the Tyaronda organ, which uh, if you look up Tyaronda online, you'll see Lots of pictures of that organ. I did cheat in the uh, presentation a bit and use a lot of post-war pictures, especially of interiors of the house because we just didn't have too many pre-war pictures. But the organ is very impressive. That was that whole enclosure was built by Richard Morris Hunt, brother-in-law of Joseph Howland. He also built the bridges in the Yes, he did. And he built um, the pedestal of the Statue of Liberty. And he built lots of other very famous uh, American buildings. I mean, when, when I say that he was America's finest architect, really, this guy was the architectural superstar of his time. So another very fascinating person to look up. And one of his sons was named Joseph Howland Hunt. So um, you know, they were, they were rather close family members. Oh, there's the organ with the music room. Any more questions? Thank you. Thank you guys so much for being here. Thank you so much. Can you take me again? I wrote it down. If I could try to find out how to find that tour because I just need to go through my phone. I can't find it. Yeah. looking. Okay, so you're going to want to go on the Howland Cultural Center Instagram. Okay. And they're going to